Welcome in the name of the Lord. Our greeting today is from Revelation chapter 19, verse 6 to 7. Alleluia! For the Lord, our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give God the glory. Well, good morning. My name is Brad Busick, and I'm the pastor here at Smith Memorial Presbyterian Church in Fairview, Oregon, and we want to welcome you to our online worship service. Uh, whether you have worshiped with us before or if this is your first time to join us, know that you are precious to us and that you are precious to God. Uh, my hope and my prayer is that this service would give glory to God and that this service would also be meaningful to you and that you might feel the love and joy of, of our risen Lord in our time together. Now, I do want to take time to thank everybody who helped with our outdoor Good Friday and Easter services, uh, from helping with the sound system, to directing traffic, to reading scripture, to uh, playing the piano and singing. Uh, I thank you so much for all your help. Uh, it was great uh, for all of us to be outside uh, worshiping together. Now we're going to be continuing our online worship service for a few more weeks until we have more people vaccinated. And if you are eligible, I do want to encourage you to make a vaccine appointment. The more people vaccinated, the sooner we can have indoor worship. Now finally, I have another announcement to make and that that is about our food pantry. Our food pantry is still going strong. And in case you have not heard, there is um, a great new way to support the ministry of our food pantry. And that's through these blue bottle drop bags. Uh, if you have a collection of cans and bottles in your house that are just waiting to be recycled, but you, you don't like to stand in the bottle drop line, um, you can come by the church office on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday mornings, and you can pick up one of these blue bags and pick up a little special bottle drop sticker. And this special sticker and these blue bags um, uh, will help you to not stand in line. You can just drop off your bags in the little kiosk and all the credit will go to the food pantry. I dropped off two bags uh, the other day and it took me about 10 seconds and then our food pantry received $27. Um, so it's really easy. So if you're interested in getting one of these blue bags, just come by the church on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday morning. And we'll give you the bag and the little sticker that gives credit to the pantry. Again, we are glad that you've joined us for worship. Let us begin our service with prayer. Holy God, you are our comfort and guide at the beginning and end of every day and our entire lives. Lord, we thank you that our entire lives and the life to come is in your loving hands. So Lord, bless this time of worship and lead us into the way of a resurrected life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will. 
worship you. A passion stirring deep inside. You're all that really satisfies. We worship you. We Thank you, Teriyaki and Michael. Let us now enter a time of confession. Let us pray the prayer that is printed upon your screen together. God of hope, you dedicated your life and love to all of us. And through your death and resurrection, you brought new life to this world. And yet we often hesitate to change anything about our lives. We don't like to sacrifice much of who we are and how we do things. Forgive us when we don't take those chances to experience new life. Enable us to worship you not just on Sunday mornings, but every day with gratitude, hope, and faithfulness. Hear now our silent prayers a confession. Amen. Here are the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. And Christ rose for us. And Christ reigns for us. And Christ even prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old life is gone and a new life has begun. My friends, know that we are all forgiven in the name of the risen Lord and be at peace and encouraged to live a new life. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35 to 51. 
Let us now listen to these beautiful words in which Paul explains the significance of the resurrection. Someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Not all flesh is alike, but there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is one thing and of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. Indeed, stars differ from star and glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the physical and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the imperishable inherit, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed.
Good morning. My name is Earl Anderson. I'm here to read scripture for you today. And I just want to say a few things about the congregation. I'm just, uh, it's been a long time since I've been in the congregation. It's been over a year. Everybody, this pandemic has just been uh, something else. So I just like to uh, just uh, say hi to everybody and realize that God's in control and we have to just keep following his lead and he uh, loves us eternally. So I will continue on with our scripture. God, God speak to us through the eternal, guide us the way of righteousness. Open up your scriptures, proclaim your words so that we may rejoice the good news through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First reading is from Luke 24, 13, 35. This passage is often called Walk Emmaus. It occurs later on the same day that Jesus was raised from the dead. Let anyone with an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying. Now on the same day, the two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus. Okay about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about these things, what that had happened. While they were talking, discussing Jesus himself, came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? The disciples stood still looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have take place in these days? Jesus asked them what things. The disciples replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how chief priests and leaders handed him over to the condemned to death and crucified him. But we have hope that he was the one, one to redeem Israel. Yes, besides all of this, it was now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women, our group, astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and then they did not find his body there. They came and told us, that they had indeed seen a vision of the angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted these them the things about himself in all scriptures. As they came near the, the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he had, were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, Jesus took bread and blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then the eyes were open, and they recognized Jesus, and he vanished from their sight. The disciples said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, these disciples got up and turned to, to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. Then these disciples told the other disciples what had happened on the road to Emmaus and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Blessed are those who hear and to keep what is written in the light of Jesus, the word made flesh. Thanks to be to God. Today's question is what happened? What things happened? 
two disciples were walking on a road after hearing about all the excitement of Easter, Jesus then comes up and walks beside them, and they don't recognize him. And Jesus is curious about what happened from their perspective. And to me, Jesus is even more curious about these two disciples just going about their regular business after just what happened. I want to begin by asking you about your post-Easter experiences. What did you do after all the excitement of Easter? What happened when you heard the story that the tomb was empty? What difference did it make in your life to hear about the risen Lord appearing to Mary and calling her by name? As you thought about the possibility of Jesus being alive and calling your name, what happened? How did that affect the rest of your week since Easter? Now, I know for many of you, you attended our outdoor Easter services or you watched it online. So what happened for you? How did the good news of Jesus being raised from the dead affect you the rest of the week? Was there an extra skip in your step? Was there an extra gleam in your smile? Did anything change after what happened? Now in our scripture passage today, we have the story of the walk to Emmaus. It's about two disciples who heard the Easter story, they heard about the resurrection, but they went back to their normal lives with the same expression on their faces. These two disciples were walking the seven mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and it was the same day as the resurrection. Apparently the, the news of the empty tomb was spreading like wildfire, and these disciples heard it, and it was exciting. Uh, the news reached these two disciples, but at first, they didn't really seem to make a difference in how they felt about life. What we hear in this scripture reading is that they still walked with their heads down and Jesus was walking right beside them and they didn't even notice it. They heard the news about the resurrection, but that news never transferred to their heart. It never transferred to, to opening their eyes. They knew the facts about Easter, but it hadn't affected their faith. So while they're walking, Jesus approaches them. He's right next to them. They don't even know it. And Jesus kind of peered into their conversation and, and entered their journey and said, what are you discussing? <laughs> what are you talking about? And it's interesting how the, the gospel writer Luke describes it. He, he says in verse 17 that right when Jesus asked that question, the two disciples just stopped in their tracks. And the two disciples stood still looking sad. And then you would think that they would jump up and down saying how excited they were about hearing the Easter story. But, but the gospel writer Luke says that they stopped, they stood still, and they looked sad. And then they said to Jesus, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these last few days? Again, look at the irony here. They, they're talking to Jesus. They just don't recognize him. And, and there's a little humor here. They're asking Jesus, are you the only stranger who, who does not know the things that have happened in these last few days? They're asking Jesus, what happened? Well, Jesus continued to walk with them and Jesus plays a little dumb here and he, he goes along with them. He says, well, okay, well, tell me what happened. What things happened? Of course, Jesus knew the answer. He experienced it. But perhaps Jesus felt that these two disciples needed to be able to 
verbalize what happened in the Easter for themselves and take a moment to ponder what it all means. You see, I, I think when you take the time to talk about things, it's actually really help, healthy to, to talk through uh, the events that have happened in your life. If you can talk about it, your brain can process the events um, and, and it can form and shape and change your heart. And so perhaps Jesus uh, was asking that question to help them to think and articulate and ponder what had happened. And perhaps Jesus is asking that question for all of us as well. What is Easter? What happened? What happened with the cross and the resurrection? Think about it. Ponder it. Talk about it. Let what happened penetrate your heart. Try putting it into words what Easter means to you. Maybe a good exercise might be for you to talk about the events of the resurrection out loud with someone and have, have a lively discussion like you're on the road to Emmaus. Anyhow, the, these two disciples told Jesus what they understood had happened. These two disciples said, a man named Jesus of Nazareth in whom the whole people of Israel had placed their hope was condemned to death and crucified. On the third day, women came to the tomb very early in the morning and they did not see his body, but instead they saw a vision of angels who said he was alive. Now the next step is, is not just knowing the story, but letting that story change you. These disciples were able to articulate what happened. It's a wonderful and joyful story, yet these guys were still walking sad. They're still busy walking. And here they're stopping. Stopping to say what happens and think about it in their hearts. They knew the facts, just like so many of us know the story of the Easter. But we just keep walking without stopping and pondering what it all means. So I think Jesus wants us to both know the story and to be changed by the story. I think for many of us, we know the facts, but our hearts are not changed. Our hearts are untouched. So let's take what happened on Easter and let's take what happened to you this week and whatever you're going through in life. And I want you to think, after Easter, have you simply just gone back to your busyness? Have you simply gone back to your old ways of doing things? Have you simply gone back to your old perspectives on life? Have you found yourself walking unchanged? Now in our first scripture reading from 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, or in the original Greek, he says we will not all fall asleep, which was a euphemism for death. He said, we'll not all sleep, but we will be changed, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Now, this is actually a favorite passage that I've seen in a lot of church nurseries, right above the cribs for the babies. Uh, it's kind of funny to read 1 Corinthians 15, 51. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. My friends, change, being changed, is, is part of God's plan for all of us. With each stage of life, we are changed. Now, as I think about back about sort of babies in the nursery, as I think about when I first became a parent, um, I was told how much my life would change. And yes, it did. If you're a parent, you, you might know how, how much life changes. Um, my life changed because a new life entered my life. Even if you're not a parent, whenever a new life enters your life, a new person, a new relationship enters your life, everything changes. You gain different perspectives, different priorities. You have a different schedule. In the case of parents, you'll have a different sleep schedule. 
New life brings change. Likewise, the resurrection, the new life that comes with the resurrection should change us. We shouldn't just walk around all mopey and sad like there's no hope and no purpose to life. The resurrection changes that. Because Jesus rose from the dead, you are going to have different perspectives, different priorities, and maybe even a different sleep schedule. How you spend your time, it'll all be disrupted. The resurrection might even give you an extra skip in your step and an extra gleam in your smile. It's one of those reasons why people ask, why are you smiling all the time? It's because I know that God's love is strong and that God's love is real. Of course, I feel sad when God God feels sad with us at different times, but but we can always recover from sadness because we know that, that death and the worst thing that could ever happen to us is never the last word that happens to us. God's love is powerful and God's love is real and the resurrection confirms that to us. It witnesses that to us. To me, the resurrection means that there is purpose in life and to this world, and that our labor is not in vain. It means that Jesus was in fact who he said he is. Jesus is God made flesh, who came to walk side by side with us. And I think it's great because I want a God to be like Jesus. I, it, it confirms to me that God is full of grace and mercy. It confirms that God cares about creation, the birds of the air, even the hairs on your head. The resurrection proves that Jesus is God and thus it confirms that God really cares about the outcast and those who are, who are ignored on the margins of society, it, it proves to us that God is good. And his love, steadfast love, endures forever. To me, the resurrection confirms the identity of Jesus. And it means that there really is a true source of love and goodness in this world and that there's so much more to life than what we see and what we do and what we spend most of our time on. It means that there is a new life that God is calling us towards. And we can begin that new life with Christ today. So my friends, don't just let Easter happen and for it not to change anything about your life. This is a joyful opportunity to live in love and faith and hope and trying a different way of of seeing things and a different way of interacting with this world. So post-Easter, we are called to change. Now, I do wanna say something else about opportunities to change. In a similar way to changing in a post-Easter world, I want to recognize that we are nearing the end of this pandemic. And I want to encourage us also, not just to simply go back to normal. I wanna close by encouraging you and encouraging myself and this entire church to not waste the lessons of the last 13 months. I have learned that the church is more than just a church building. It really is you, the people. I have learned that we can experiment with different ways of worship and connecting with one another, and God is still at work. Sometimes God does even better work than we expect through these experimentations. Yes, we may long for the past, and that is normal, but we're not called to simply go back to normal, to go back to how it used to be. Again, we are Christians. 
We believe in the resurrection of the dead. That is in no ways normal. And believe me, that that resurrection should constantly change us. It should change our priorities and perspectives, not just as our individual lives, but, but it should open our hearts to, to how we might be the church of the risen Lord. It leads us to open our hearts to see Jesus in our midst, perhaps even when we're just out on the road interacting with strangers. None of us are to remain the same. We are to be transformed. We are to change both as individuals and as a congregation. So I just want to say that I cannot wait to come back for in-person and indoor worship. And a lot of what we're going to do is going to be the same. But I want you not to be surprised if some things are different. And actually, I want you to be encouraged and, and to encourage all of us to actually do things that are different. I mean, Jesus has been with us in the last 13 months. Surely we have learned something. Surely we have become stronger and more faithful Christians because of it. And part of the good news of the resurrection is that we can trust Jesus to lead us to new ways of living with grace and humility. We can reach out to those who are overlooked. We can risk the hostile stare. We can challenge traditions. We can extend hospitality and give people a taste of heaven. We can reprioritize our time and our schedules. We can lay down our lives for the sake of our neighbors. We can love freely and boldly. We have an opportunity uh, to experiment with new ways of being the church and new ways of living out the gospel for our particular context and in our daily lives. We can do this because of the assurance that the risen Lord walks among us. He walks beside you, he walks beside me, and he takes us to new places. He walks with us through all the changes and the journeys of life. And so just as in the story of, of the walk to Emmaus, Jesus is walking with you. Perhaps he is even present in the stranger that you meet on the road. So my friends, let's be Easter people. Let's not be the same people we were before. Let the joy of the resurrection change how you walk and how we walk together. Let it fill your heart with a new passion and a new hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord.
Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for walking with us. We give you thanks and praise for your constant love and for the resurrected life. We thank you for your presence on this pilgrim's journey. May your spirit continue to breathe new life into us. Strengthen our faith, use our gifts, and work within us to share your love, to bear your fruit, and to give witness in our lives to the transforming joy of the resurrection of Christ our Lord. So hear us now as we lift up to you our joys and our concerns. We pray all this in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together as one family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our blessing today is from John chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. So my friends, let your life be a sign of Christ's life so that others may come to believe that the Lord is risen indeed. Amen. Now our post salute today is a musical offering from our guest vocalist Teriyaki Jefferson and the song is entitled No One Ever Cared For Me like Jesus. And so as we close this worship service, may this song bless your soul. Oh, let this be their memory. 
Oh, 